Hi there, welcome to this short video on protective conductor size calculations. After we have completed our live working at the origin of the supply, we should have noted down uh, all of our test results as we've been carrying out our works. This wee table here that you can see, um, if you can reproduce it, obviously without these values in it, but if you can reproduce this table prior to starting your live working, it will do the majority of the heavy lifting for you uh, when it comes to working out what your various results are, okay, and what you do with these results. So you'll see there we have carried out six earth fault loop impedance tests, two on line one, two on line two, two on line three. The highest of which, as we can see here, is 0 0.23 ohms. So that's the one that we would record on our certificate and our condition report, okay? We've then moved on after we've reconnected our earthing conductor and uh, carried out our air fault loop impedance at the DB and our prospective air fault current, okay? Depending on your meter, it may just show both values or you may have to hit a function button to switch in between the values that you obtain, but it's the one test, um, the meter does both of these um, tests at the same time, okay? So you'll see there for the air fault loop impedance at the DB, our highest value that we've obtained here is 0 0.19, and that's what we would record on our test result sheets as the ZS at DB. Looking at our prospective air fault current, we have 1.31 kiloamps um, measured. And that 1.31 kiloamps, this is where we're going to be utilizing it here. We're going to be using it, uh, utilizing it in this adiabatic equation um, to make sure that our protective conductor is the right size in order to meet what's called the thermal constraints. Okay, make sure we're not going to damage that insulation uh, under fault conditions. Then we would carry out our prospective short circuit current, do that line one to neutral, line two to neutral, line three to neutral, the highest of which we then take, which is 1.46, because it's a three-phase system, we will multiply it by two. Now, if this was just a single phase supply, so see we were all on line one here, um, I would be taking that 1.46 and recording it as my IPF, okay? Um, when it's a three-phase system, we take that 1.46 and we multiply it by two. That gives us 2.92 kiloamps. And again, that's what we record on our certificate and our report. And it also gets recorded on our schedule of test results. We then have a look at the rest of our installation. So as we can see seen from the, the previous slide, it's a three-phase system. In the service head, we can see on the label and in the service head that uh, it is 100 ampere BS1361 fuses, okay? Uh, the cables that are coming from the service head into the meter and then back into our installation are 50 millimeter double insulated tails. So 50 millimeter squared double insulated tails. And from the side of the service head, we have an earthing conductor which runs into a separate Henley block, a main earthing terminal, and that cable is 16 millimetres squared, okay? So when it comes to checking for our protective conductor size options, we have two options. We can check it by calculation or as per regulation 543.1.4. Now, 543.1.4 basically tells us to look in table 54.7. And our protective conductor is selected uh, in relation to the size of the line conductor, okay? So you see here, we have a 50 millimeter squared line conductor. We've got a 16 millimeter squared earthing conductor. We're interested in this line conductor. So it says in the table here that if your line conductor is greater than 35 millimeter squared, then your protective conductor, if it's of the same material, and that's the assumption we're making here, then that the protective conductor has to be at least half of the line conductor size. So if we were using this table here, if we were selecting it as per regulation 543.1.4, then that protective conductor would have to be at least 25 millimeters squared. So the protective conductor has not been selected as per the second point, 
hopefully if this is an initial verification you'll have the calculations there from the designer but if it's a periodic inspection you probably will not so you'll have to carry out the calculation yourself to confirm that this 16 millimeter squared earthen conductor meets the requirements for thermal constraints as in it's not going to be damaged in the event of a fault at the service head okay or at the, the, the main switch so 543.1.3 that's where we have the, the calculation method, okay? And the calculation method identifies this uh, adiabatic equation, okay? So underneath the adiabatic equation, we have the key, okay? So it tells you there that the S is the minimum size, remember, remember that, minimum size of protective conductor that's required. The I is the measured fault current. Uh, the T, is the time that takes the overcurrent protects the device that's in front of the circuit. In this instance, uh, the, 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 the fuses that are in the service head, the time it takes those fuses to operate with this fault current flown. And then the K, well, that's a correction factor that we apply depending upon the type of protective conductor uh, that we are supplying this circuit or in this case this installation with okay and we find that correction factor from tables 54.2 all the way through to table 54.6 so in our uh one of our first slides here our measured our highest measured prospective earth fault current was 1.31 kiloamps okay so that's the i value that we're going to be using okay and then we have this information here from our inspection. We have a 100 amp BS1361 fuse. Okay. Now, here's the problem. We've not had a BS1361 fuse and BS7671 since the 2011, uh, was it the green amendment of the 17th edition? Why? Because there were some changes to the fusing, uh, or the, the fuses, um, and this British standard number has been withdrawn. So if you go into British Standards uh, in Appendix 1 in BS7671 and you go down to BS1361, you'll see there it was replaced in 2010 by, an, by a BS88-3 fuse. Okay. So in relation to this fuse here, we're not going to look at a 1361 fuse, we're going to look at a BS88-3 fuse. So if we get into Appendix 3, the first figure in appendix 3 is figure 3a1 and that's for the bs88-3 fuse okay so we could plot our values here to try to work out what the actual disconnection time is but because of the the fact it's uh, a logarithmic table um, it's going to be difficult for us to correctly identify the disconnection time by plotting that 1,300 amps up somewhere in this region, okay? So it's going to be in this region here that we would have to plot that up, but so because we can't do it accurately, we have to rely on the, the use of this table, okay? So looking at the table, we measured 1.31 kiloamps, 1,310 amps, okay? Looking at the 100 amp fuse, you see we have lots of different current values here for various different disconnection times. Our 1.31 kiloamps lands in between these two uh, values at the bottom here, okay, for the 100 amp device, which means that we're going to use a 0 0.2 second disconnection time because it's not quite 1,450, but it is 1,230 amps or more. Okay, so we're going to use 0 0.2 seconds as our disconnection time. The next thing we need to find is the K value for this particular uh, conductor. So remember, we have a separate conductor leaving the side of the service head, going to a Henley block before it enters the, the board. Okay, so if you look at table 54.2 and look at the heading there, you'll see there it's uh, the K value for a protective conductor that's not incorporated in the cable, not bunched, or for separate protective conductors in contact with the cable covering, but not bunched with cables, where they assume the initial temperature is 30 degrees C. How I utilise this table is, any time I see 30 degrees C, I just think the cable is separate. Okay, 
because if you look at the second table, you'll see there the temperature here is 70 degrees C and it is incorporated uh, or bunched with the other cables. So if the other cables are under load conditions, they'll be sitting at, if they're under full load conditions, 70 degrees C. Therefore, your protective inductor will have been brought up to roughly that temperature as well. Okay, so this first table is the one that we're going to be looking at, but what are the other tables? Well, table 54.4 is for the sheath or armour. Um, of a cable as a, the protective conductor, 54.5 is for steel conduit ducting and trunking as a protective conductor, and 54.6 is for a bare conductor where there's no risk of uh, damage to any neighbouring material by the, the, the temperature indicated. So we're going to look at table 54.2. So in table 54.2, we're going to assume it's a 70 degrees C thermoplastic cable and it is copper which then gives us two options, 143 or 133. 133 here, you'll see it's for cables above 300 millimetres squared. Therefore, we're going to use 143 as our correction factor. So we have our values. What we're going to do is we're then just going to pop those values into our adiabatic equation. So we take our 1310 amperes and we need to remember to square it. Okay, and then we multiply it by that disconnection time. After we've squared it and multiplied it by the disconnection time, we then find out the square root of it. Okay. We then take that value and then divide it by the 143. If you have a scientific calculator, you can punch it in as it looks in your scientific calculator uh, and then just hit equals. Okay, failing that, you're having to do this in stages. All right. And that gives us a minimum cross-sectional area of 4.1 millimetres squared. Okay, so remember, this is the minimum cross-sectional area. For our uh, installation, we have a 16 millimetre uh, squared cable installed, okay, in our installation. Now, as a result of this, we can see that 16 millimetre squared is clearly bigger than 4.1. Therefore, it passes the thermal constraints, okay? So, hopefully straightforward, um, in your handouts you will have tutorials on various different uh, thermal constraints calculations, plod your way through those thermal constraints calcs, um, once you're finished, the great thing about uh, those handouts is that you can change a figure, which can then mean that you've got a, a, a virtually unlimited number of practice attempts at this, okay? So hopefully that's helped you. Uh, if there's any issues, remember, um, drop me a message and uh, hopefully we will uh, 